Let's get started. Our first guest is currently an associate professor of English at St. John's University in New York City, where he teaches creative writing. His first novel is The Third Sign. He has a new short story out in the anthology When the Villain Comes Home. And along with past Tuesday Funk reader, Bradley P. Bollier, is the co-host of the podcast Speculate, the podcast for writers, readers, and fans. Please welcome back to our microphone, Gregory A. Wilson. Hello everyone, um, honored to be opening up this awesome lineup. Um, I'm going to read something from a character treatment that I did for a game uh, called Ascension uh, a couple of years ago, um, which uh, had some different components to it. Um, I was doing some flavor text and work on cards as well. And so this seemed to fit the time and everything else. Uh, this is from one of the factions um, that are presented in that game. And so if you hear concepts that don't make any sense, buy the game, and it will then all make sense. <laughs> His metal-clad hand firmly clamped over the body of the struggling two-fold and sweeper, its head whipping side to side as its wheels spun and gears, gears squealed in protest. Artiban driven gear shook his head and sighed. This was the fifth time this cycle he had to track down a rogue sweeper, about five times more than normal, and there was no obvious reason he could find that would explain the uncanny increase. He'd started with the fourth level formation device, the FLFD, of course, He'd rotated the inductor coil a total of 73 revolutions so far with no result, and run the scaler over the central conducting spring 136 times until it was smooth enough to reflect light. But the sweepers the device was producing continued to deviate from their movement patterns. It was possible that five individual sweepers were simply defective all at once, but their job to scour the floors for loose pieces of metal and coil and pulverize them in their small but powerful interior mashers was a painfully simple one. And besides, it had never happened before, at least for as long as Artiban could remember, which was a very long time indeed. He took pride in his memory. Of all the caretakers in the quadrant clock, he had the fewest missed assignments and the fewest mechanical inconsistencies in his sector. Yet here, he had five deviations in one cycle. Trouble was sure to come of it. With another sigh, Artiban rose to his full seven-foot height, still holding the squirming two-fold and sweeper in his massive glove. Steam hissed and Metal Gear's word as he straightened himself, looking down the long corridor which led from the fourth level auxiliary engine room to the main hub of the level. His Mark II mechano goggles, which were a trifle outdated, but he never felt comfortable with the Mark III's, clicked as he cycled through several frequencies and light spectrums till he returned to day, normal ambient. He'd used X-ray heavy to find the offending sweeper, which had scurried underneath the row of gears and pistons in the back of the room at his approach, which sadly was never quiet. Triplated and appropriately jointed grayish gold valenium covered his legs all the way to the waist, while his arms and torso were fitted with the same material, overlaid by a steam-powered, gear-covered exoskeleton. It made him strong enough for the tasks required, lifting a ton of loose debris and various metallic odds and ends, pile-driving through the level rock structure still visible near the ground levels of the quadrant clock, but not particularly stealthy. Oh, he could fix items with his finely articulated glove overlays, the fine detail region inspector is 2400 grade, but he was no seeker. His was to build, repair, form, and clean, not trap down and capture a measly two-fold and sweeper. But he was beginning not to trust the FLFD, even if he could find nothing wrong with it, and until he knew what was going on, he was determined not to add to the problem. If the seeker had the same problems as the sweepers, it might wander off into the machinery, and cause damage which could take hundreds of cycles to fix. So here he was, holding a piece of rebellious machinery 1,000 his weight, a little wriggling metallic creation of a hundred small gears and springs, and one central power core barely strong enough to light an instrument panel. Like the others, this would have to be destroyed. With a hiss and clank, Artiban set off down the hallway, one massive boot after the other impacting the indefatigable metal floor. A soft crunch came within the body of the sweeper as it twisted towards him, and the caretaker eyed it suspiciously. Beyond the obvious potential for embarrassment with the other caretakers at his inability to maintain his sector, defective items bothered Artiban on an almost primitive level. Things had a certain way of working, predictable and obvious and unfaltering, and when they broke down, there were clear reasons as to why. He doubted very much that his father, or his father's father, had ever been as vexed by an improperly functioning unit as he had. 
but then he doubted that either of them had to deal with as complex an environment as he did. Emerging into the fourth level's main hub, he turned left towards the passageway which led to the main compactor. But before he entered, he halted, as always, in front of the clear shell window, practically invisible, but nearly as strong as his millennium-covered suit. He had seen this sight 6,755 times to date, yet it had never grown tiresome. The quadrant clock stood in the center of the city of Heb, largest metropolis on the world of Hedron. As the clock slowly turned, half a rotation for every cycle, the whirling gears and sparkling machinery of the city glittered below. To the west was the district of the builders, its skyline uneven and erratic, every home outfitted in mechanical splendor, more awe-striking than the next, each resident determined to outdo his neighbor in technical skill and, of course, efficient use of gadgetry. To the east was the parts district, where hundreds of thousands of cogs, gears, springs, steam, and power cores, and every other element critical to the building of the world of Hedron changed hands daily. Every buyer determined to find the best bargains possible on the things which made his or her life possible. To the south lay the mechano fields, the testing and proving ground for every invention made in Heb. It was illegal to use any item which had not been certified in the mechano fields, but in truth the law was unnecessary. For the residents of Heb and Hedron, testing was usually more fun than actual use. And to the north stood one massive triangular building made of brightly gleaming metal, surrounded by a healthy space devoid of buildings or life, the pyramid. This was the seat of government and religion in Hedron. From here, Yuloth the Builder made his will known to the architects and inventors who made up the governing council of the planet. A summons to the pyramid was both the dream and nightmare of every resident of Hedron, a dream that he or she had invented something powerful enough to attract the attention of the council, a nightmare that it might be deemed too powerful for either it or its inventor to survive. And towering over the city and planet, holding the entire surface of the world together, was the quadrant clock, regulating the time and energy without which the mechanical structures and life itself on Hedron would fail. Our world. Artiban heard something say with a grinding crunch, and with a start he looked down at the source of the voice. It was the sweeper, which had grown still in the caretaker's grasp. This is our world, it repeated. Artiban recoiled, almost dropping his captive. Sweepers couldn't talk, well, not the twofold in kind. They had no vocal mechanism. Yet there it was, external metal jaw working as if it were speaking. All that we are comes from this place, it said. But all of it will be lost now that Samael has returned. All of this will grind to a halt, and our world itself break, stop, and rust into oblivion. What will you do about it? It stopped, and after a moment, Artiban realized it was waiting for him to respond. Uh, what, what, what can I do? He managed at last, trying not to think about the fact he was talking with a two-fold and sweeper. I'm only a caretaker. You're more than that, Artiban, and less the sweeper said in the same strange, metallic voice. You have power to help stop Samael and save Hedron. More than Hedron, in fact, the universe itself. Or you can remain a caretaker until you break down, as your father did, and his father before him. For you there will be no memory then of what you lost and what you could have found. Then it fell silent, and for a long time Artaban said nothing staring at the now calm sweeper. No caretaker liked being reminded of its creation, nor did it like remembering its own mechanical status, a machine which could and would eventually break down like any other and be scrapped, like the sweeper. He thought for a long time, looking out onto the sparkling mechanical perfection of head. He looked down the passageway to the main compactor. Finally, he looked again at the sweeper, lying now quite still in his grasp. And then, suddenly, he put the sweeper on his shoulder, feeling its wheels lock in place as he placed a restraining band over its body to hold it secure. And turning away from the compactor, he took purposeful and massive strides down the corridor which exited the fourth level. For the very first time, Artiban Driven Gear, third revision, had made an entirely unpredictable decision. And even more shockingly, he was glad of it. <laughs>